last presentation today, please welcome Dr. Ashish Gupta um, from the University of Minnesota, and he's going to talk to us about the ALD National Registry and biorepository update. So I'm Ashish Gupta, I'm one of the uh, transplanters at University of Minnesota, and as University of Minnesota has been evoked multiple times, uh, we take quite a bit of blame for ALD. Um, but what I'm going to present today is one of our endeavors, uh, which um, it's interesting to hear some of the questions that have come up, and this national registry actually is the attempt to address some of that. So I'll kind of like skip this slide. I'm pretty sure you guys are tired of hearing about ALD introduction. Um, so what I'm going to jump into is ALD National Registry. And uh, um, this National Registry, um, did I lose my slide? No, okay. Um, it's a, it, was an, it was a long discussion actually internally to see how we um, build this registry. And as we heard from Dr. Adang, there was, uh, there was a multi-center based approach um, that um, their group took. We actually started this registry as a family-based registry and biobank, where um, the participation in the registry is completely voluntary and it is a family-driven registry, actually. We wanted to make it convenient for the family, so it's literally a single-click enrollment. Um, and I'll show you the website at webpage as we navigate through this. And one of the big things that we wanted to do with this registry, and mind, mind you, this is like in 2018, this is pre-COVID, um, we wanted to do that, we wanted to make it in a way that we could do entire participation in the registry remotely. So no one needs to, needed to travel to Minnesota to be a part of the registry. And this, this is meant for both children and adults with ALD, including females with a mutation. So how does the registry work, actually? So uh, there are online surveys, there is medical data abstraction, and there is biospecimen banking. Again, I'm giving you an overview of the registry. Um, and what the first step for the registry is literally filling out an expression of interest form. Um, thank you to the families. We have more than 300 of those, actually, now. Um, and once we get these expression of interest form, um, and I'll show you what it looks like, you ask very basic questions about are you interested in participation in this registry and your contact information? Then one of our team member reaches out to you and uh, we describe what is there in the registry and uh, once families are on board, we send them an e-consent actually. Um, once the e-consent is filled, it also has a release of in information, actually consent. Uh, we send what is called as an intake survey on our part. In the meantime, our team also gets the release of information and gets the medical data and uh, we also coordinate the procuring of biospecimens actually on this registry. And then there is a follow-up survey every six months. Again, it is a short survey, just making sure if there is any update to um, different things for the participant. So this is our web page, and if you like, click this link, uh, there is a tab called Enroll Now. When you click that one, this is the basic expression of interest form that, fill, that pops up. It will ask you if you are filling it for yourself or if you are filling it for your child and basic information about um, how to contact you. Once that is filled, again, we do the e-consent. Um, I didn't put a snippet of the e-consent, but it is literally um, a red cap based e-consent. It used to be an Adobe PDF based consent. And again, you have that with you in your records and you can sign it electronically, like nothing that you need to spend more than like two minutes figuring out how to sign. I mean, take your time to read the consent for sure. Um, and then we send the intake survey where it is basically divided into three main parts. First of all are the demographics. We look at these variables and then we get the provider information. Another thing that I would add here is that we also ask if the families are connected to uh, any comprehensive ALT clinic. We also look into the disease history on the, on the online survey. And again, it is not in-depth disease history. It is essentially what families remember and um, if the biochemical testing was done or not, if yes or no, if genetic testing was done or not. No numbers or anything there that we are looking at. Same thing for imaging. And we delve a little bit deeper into the family history there. Um, one of the other important things, uh, regarding the diagnosis, how the ALD was diagnosed. We do ask about the modality of diagnosis, and one of the important things that we focus on is newborn screening, or is it a family history, or was it due to adrenal insufficiency, um, or whatever way it was diagnosed. 
So once this intake survey is done, we do a follow-up survey every six months. Again, it is short. Again, it is essentially change in, if there is any change in demographics, change in provider information, any change in symptoms that could be related to ALD, any ER visits, any new family members that, were, that have been diagnosed, any new treatments actually that were started for the participant. A lot of work actually, and again I give credit to my team for this, um, is medical record data abstraction, where we look through the medical charts, we extract the information about the comorbidities, the medications, the treatment, especially the steroid replacement or any other therapy, for example, for seizures or any other symptoms that are there. And also we actually, um, again, look at the family history in this medical re record data abstraction. This is where we look at the lab data. We look at the biochemical testing, genetic testing, as, as well as adrenal function testing. Um, and then we have a, an imaging biorepository where we, we get the MRIs. So also attached with this registry is a biospecimen banking. We do four biospecimens. We do buckle swab at the time of entry into the registry. And I'll use the word try. We try our best to get blood, urine, and stool every six months for the children in the high-risk age group. And for adults, we have limited this to just blood every year. Again, there are several limitations to be able to get everything in place, and we'll, I'll talk about, I'll mention about it a little later in the presentation. So this is some of the data on our new one screen cohort that we have on the registry, and I'm presenting this data for 72 new, new bonds. Um, on the registry right, uh, right now, there are about, eight, about 80, actually. And this is across multiple states. So there are 14 states listed here. Um, as you can see, of course, Minnesota has the highest participation because we are sitting right there. Uh, but there are more than 15 states that are participating in this right now. This is the median age at enrollment. Again, uh, over the, as you can imagine, over a period of time, we are getting younger and younger. Um, the initial range was zero to six years. Again, this is not that every single newborn, as soon as they are diagnosed, they participate in the registry. Some newborns are older, like especially if they are outside Minnesota, like when they hear about the registry, when they get connected to us, um, that is when they participate. Uh, Looking at the racial distribution, again, 64% are white. Um, there is um, a small proportion of unknown or participant refusal there, which is inherent to any survey that you do. We have, interestingly, three twins and um, one child that um, was born in Florida but was adopted by a family. Um, and actually, this is, this is the beauty of this national registry also, is that we are not limited by states. We cross the borders, and uh, we'll show you how we loop, it, loop in back uh, this information to the newborn screen programs. Another important information, and that, is, that goes into cascade testing that Amy was mentioning earlier, is we look into how many other family members were diagnosed because of the index case. And again, this is a little work in progress because we are trying to capture this information every six months so that we can build up over the years how many like total family members were diagnosed, but um, usually it is ranging between zero to eight and a median of two, and again, this is every six months. And it varies quite a bit. This is just the distribution of the biochemical data. Again, LysoPC data is not available for every single kid. Um, as we know, different states have different cutoffs and it gets a little tricky. I'm just presenting the data that we have right now. Um, the range is from 0 0.16 to 1.85. Uh, with a mean of 0.55. Same thing for C26 and C24 assays. Um, different labs, different units. So again, this is just a distribution, no analysis or anything. Um, and as you can see, there is um, there's a wide range there. C26-22 ratios and C24-22 ratios are presented here. The gray bars are the normal zones. So as you can see, uh, for both, actually, so far, we have Quite a bit of distribution there, but uh, looks like the newborn screen programs are doing a really good job picking up the kids with uh, these biochemical deficiencies. One of our favorite things is to look at mutations, as Dr. Kemp keeps on increasing his database with 900, 950, and we are, I don't know if we crossed 1,000 already. Uh, we have so far 36 individual mutations in this registry. Uh, and this is, again, for the 72 uh, kids uh, diagnosed with newborn screen. Uh, there are some mutations that are multiple, and this is the, the distribution about for 
pathogenic, like likely pathogenic, and VUS, which is one of our favorite topics. One of the things that we are trying to do with this registry is to assess these mutations every six months, uh, cr cross-checking with different databases to see if any of the VUSs have been reported as pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Molly stepped out, but this is actually one thing that I wanted to mention as Molly was elaborating on this. Um, so there are quite a few abnormal ACTH and cortisols. Um, again, that is a screening test. So we have 47 patients with abnormal ACTH and cortisol, but none of them developed adrenal insufficiency. Patients who underwent ACTH stimulation tests, um, like 22, they actually, seven out of them actually um, were, even, were abnormal, and those are the ones um, who developed adrenal insufficiency. There are four, actually, who developed early adrenal insufficiency who received stress dose alone, and then there are seven uh, who received stress and maintenance uh, uh, steroids for adrenal insufficiency. Uh, we also look at the ER visits in the last six months. Again, this is kind of like an ongoing survey every six months. Um, we asked the families if there was any AI-related visit to the ER, and uh, there were three in the past six months when we, from the last cutoff we had. There are also three patients, and again, these are all the new on-screen patients um, who eventually developed cerebral ALD. I will just mention the first case, uh, five-year-old male. Again, if you think of what um, Eric presented, the median age was six and a half years. With new on screen, we are, cap we are capturing them even younger. Um, we monitored the lesion, and as we see the growth in the lesion, the child eventually underwent a match unrelated bone marrow transplant at University of Minnesota. He's nine months out, disease arrested at one month post-transplant, no functional deficit so far, and is doing really well. A Couple of other things that we capture on our surveys, actually, um, is ab about the barrier to access to care. And this information is always very helpful because not just for us, but for advocacy groups and for the newborn screen programs also, this tells us where, where the deficits are. And um, these, this is, like not a single choice, so families can choose whatever they feel have been issues with the barrier to access to care. And it's very interesting about uh, like what what is picked here is lack of information about ALD. Again, there has been a lot of work done on, done on this, and organizations like ALD Alliance and other organizations are doing great work in um, spreading that information. Uh, another piece is lack of disease knowledge among primary providers, and that has been also one of our focus where uh, we are trying to see what we can do to educate primary providers about ALD, its different phenotypes, and the treatment options that are there. The other piece that we collect on our surveys is about the family concerns, um, and like very appropriately, development of newer therapies. Many of us in the room here um, are all working on this concerns with disease monitoring and surveillance. Um, as Eric mentioned, yes, there is room to individualize it and see what are, what are, who are the high-risk group and who are not the high-risk group. There is financial concern attached to it. There is increased anxiety, or it should be our depression, actually, in the families, and need for family support groups. All of these are very important points, actually. So on the long-term follow-up, um, as I was mentioning, this, what this registry does is actually we feed into the newborn screen programs. And what we do is that, like we have reached out to all the states that are doing newborn screen, and especially the ones where we have the participants from respective states. We give them actually semi-annual semi -annual update actually um, from this registry, including the biochemical data, the, the, the phenotype data, and whatever we have. And so far, we are, we, we work with seven states, and New York is one of them, and they receive every six months report actually from us. There is no reciprocal data that we are asking or we receive from the state. It is, again, whosoever is in our state. And one of the beauties of this is, like, there is a very classic example where there, was a, there is a child that was identified by New York, New York State newborn screen, but they moved to a different state. Now, as I understand, the state newborn screen follow-up programs are not able to capture that data once the, once the family is not in the state. But on this national registry, it is not like there's no limitation, and we can still capture the data, and we can still report back to the New York State. So it helps, uh, helps the state also assess the impact of the newborn screen programs. And again, more data, more robust, robust follow-up, and uh, we are not limited by migration across the states. 
So what we essentially did here is literally closing, we closed the loop actually with this registry. The goal is really to get this information back to the states and really have an idea of like what exactly um, happens with these, these kids because ALD is a very different disease. If you look at the newborn screen programs, the, this is a disease where you might never develop a phenotype versus you might develop a phenotype in five years or 25 years. And there is no way to, for the, for the state newborn screen programs to really measure that information except something which does a long-term follow-up. So I'll stop here, and again, this is like our team, and again, main, 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 main thank you to the participants and families. Like this is a family-driven and totally fam family-oriented registry, so we thank you wholeheartedly for participating in this registry. Miranda, it's the end of the day, so. No, no I'm just kidding. I, I, um, <laughs> I'm just curious, how is it going? Obviously, it's easy for the families that are in Minnesota, but how is it going for the, the patients that scan locally across the country, retrieving those actual scans? How is that? Because, I mean, even just as a mom, I know sometimes that's hard when I have to send out to <laughs> someone else that I want to give a second look. So how is that going for you guys? Yeah, so I completely agree. For when the patients are local, it is much, much, much easier. Especially for the scans, we, we are extensively working for an imaging biorepository. What it will enable is that we would be able to open a portal like everywhere. So it, it, it is kind of like an online portal and you should be able to like just transfer the scan there. Actually, the radiology groups have been much better now. Actually, there's literally a single click in the packs which can transfer the scans. It is not super functional for remote families at this point. That's why we have not asked for the scans. Like we always have the option to ask for the disk, but we want to make it electronic rather than like needing to go and get that manual disk and then you guys sending it over to us. It's just too much, com too cumbersome actually. We'll, we live in this day and age where we should be able to pull it up. But there are some server space issues, there is HIPAA issue, all of those actually, whatever we build actually has to be compliant with all those measures. So that, that piece is, is taking, um, taking some time actually. The other piece I would mention for the remote families is getting the biospecimens. It's been a challenge because we try to coordinate with the families when they are going for their doctor's appointments so that we don't have an extra poke or um, any extra burden to the families, but there's a spectrum and some families are very communicative, some families, um, like a lot of times we reach after the fact <laughs> and sometimes we don't get the kit back. So it kind of like we have limited kits that we like put in circulation. So logistically it is, it is a big challenge. Um, so we're still sorting some of those pieces out, but uh, yeah, overall we have decent amount of specimens and decent data, especially in terms of like medical record abstraction, like this is for all 72 patients, so 72 newborn screen kids. We have more than 300 in the registry right now. So it's a, a, it's a big data mine right now. We have not been able to reach to the point where we could see like what is the completion rate actually and how, many, how much of total data we have. We are like taking one step at a time. Thank you. <laughs>